Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is my favorite game in the series. It was the first one I beat, and it's the one I've played the most. I've beaten it numerous times, just within the last few years. I unabashedly love and cherish this piece of art, and it ranks as my second favorite game of all time. That context is important, because all the love and care I give the rest of this series comes from my deep love of Xenoblade 2. Rex is my favorite character in the series, with Jin as a close follow-up. Torna clocks in as my favorite prequel ever. Allrest is my favorite world. 2 has my favorite music. 2 also has my favorite combat in the series. But the reason I'm talking about 2 right now is not just because I love it, or because I've done Xenoblade 1 for three weeks straight at this point. It's because of the style of story that Xenoblade Chronicles is. You see, and this is a big spoiler for if you haven't beaten 2 yet, Xenoblade 2 happens at the same time as Xenoblade Chronicles 1. These stories are parallel, happening in worlds apart, but connected through a singular character. And while you can play either game as a separate entity and be wholly satisfied with what you played, when studying the themes and motifs and threads that connect these games, I believe the proper way to do so is by looking at these games side by side. To see when one game zigs and the other zags, when one game goes for an emotional high or the other for an emotional low, the development of Shulk and Rex, and how both games portray the human condition, and how each game analyzes different aspects of that. I've talked about the specific events and pacing of the Xenoblade 2 intro before, and I'll leave a link in the description for that video. But to me, while Xenoblade 2's intro may be slow for others, for me it's arguably the best. And my favorite. I love Sky Continents. Love them. Full disclaimer. So Allrest, as a set piece, was immediately engrossing for me from within the first few seconds. It captivated me like few other game worlds had at the time, or had since. Especially when I was just getting to RPGs, and especially RPGs from Japan at the time when I first played this a couple weeks after release. Where Xenoblade 1 begins with a bang, with a fight between the Mechonis and Bionis on top of the Battle of Sword Valley, Xenoblade 2 elects for a far slower pace. To introduce you to Allvest and the main character Vex, it shows you him salvaging. One of the only times they actually show this happen in the game, outside of him just jumping off a pier, delving beneath the clouds, trying to find treasures and secrets that the Cloud Sea obfuscates. Interesting foreshadowing for how the plot will progress later with Mortitha, huh? He returns to the surface on the back of Gramps as they strike up a conversation about the state of the world after Rex enjoys some absolute Giga Chad sized crab legs. My god! Huh, so that explains the growth spurt. And Gramps enjoys the warmth of the fire on his tired back. They talk about the world slowly dying as titans, the giant beasts that swim across the cloud sea, where all the peoples of the world live on the backs of, die, one by one as the world's clock is coming to an end. It's a slow, somber demise as civilizations of ages long past sink beneath the clouds in an instant, never to be seen again, making the sea just a little bit lonelier one by one. As the world's clock is coming to an end, tick tock, tick tock. It's a slow, somber demise but one that progresses forward nevertheless. Xenoblade 1 has war as a central theme, and the emotional human responses we have as a result of that stimuli. Whereas in Xenoblade 2, the world is aging and fading in the twilight of its times, and the game deals with the humans and civilization reacting to those stimuli. Resources are being dried up as less and less land is available for civilization or humanity, to live on. Heck, the story of Moradane is literally one of limited resources, as Moradane dries up and is on the verge of dying any year now. And one of the things fueling Moradane's colonial aspirations and imperialistic tendencies is because they don't have sufficient resources to satiate their population. When you think of it like that, these intros make perfect sense for their respective stories, right? One story is about war and the character's response to that, so it starts with a myriad of battles and high adrenaline sections. Whereas, the other is dealing with a dying world filled with people grasping on the last vestiges of hope centered around a boy who dreams of paradise, of Elysium, with his head in the clouds. 
Funny how the game is set in a world of clouds, isn't it? And as a salvager, he dives headfirst into those clouds, staring up at the world tree all the while that dominates the horizon with promises of salvation atop its bows. Xenoblade 2 is all about a boy. Boy! Not the God of War variety. Who dreams of a better tomorrow, of an Elysium to save humanity from this dying world, and the story progresses in a way with him garnering a better understanding of humanity, the righteous and the contemptible, and him realizing that blind idealism and hope will not save the day, but they can be refined and honed in such a way to be utilized as tools to remedy many of the problems inherent in the structures of human civilization, and the problems that we cause to one another, of our own machinations. Xenoblade 2 is all about Rex, our protagonist, a young boy, who is about to be thrust out into the open world stage and become the center of attention, navigate the complexities of human interaction and civilization as he strives ever heavensward towards the mythical paradise of Elysium. Quite literally, that's on the back of the box, and for me personally, I've always had a special fondness or affinity for that little blurb in the back of Xenoblade 2's box. I would always just read it from time to time, and it would put a smile on my face as I reminisce about one of my favorite games. All rest, a world in which massive creatures called Titans drift through a boundless sea of clouds. In such a world, people have made their homes on the backs of these Titans. Join Rex, a young man who becomes the driver of Pyra, a mysterious life form in his blade, as they embark on a quest to find the mythical paradise of Elysium. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 covers a different aspect of the human condition compared to its counterpart Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Whereas the first game deals with trauma, fear, grief, and anguish, and desperation, Xenoblade 2 causes a different aspect of the human condition to be studied and analyzed. It covers concepts like dreams, hopes, and aspirations, and what happens when those dreams, hopes, and aspirations experience a varying array of different stimuli, whether or not those dreams are reinforced or impeded, and how those dreams and how those people respond and cope with those stimuli. And the game also deals with those concepts of dreams, hopes, and aspirations being smothered in the crib as shown to the character of Nia, and sometimes fruitless endeavors and pursuits to try and reignite those sparks of hope, those dreams, those aspirations, the things that fuel us as people, the will to be alive, and it takes in combined effort and the entire group together, working in unison in order to achieve and find that new reality, the new dream to aspire to, that new Elysium, and so, when even characters who are devoid of their own dreams meet up with Vex, they are able to latch onto his for a better world to try and save the entirety of the world through a painful, slow demise with the death of all the Titans. Xenoblade 2 also covers another facet of the idea of dreams, and that is what if you fear the ability to dream your own, to fear your own self-preservation, to view it as an existential crisis upon the rest of the world and the people you hold sacred, the people you cherish, the people you adore. That story is personified through Mithra and Pyra. And at the end of it all, the underlying principle <clears throat> is you need to dream of a better tomorrow. But you need to be realistic about it. You need to understand the complexities of the world that you inhabit. And people that live in that blind idealism will not save the day because that idealism coupled with ignorance will achieve nothing. However, when you couple idealism with ingenuity and cooperation, you are able to achieve lofty goals that at one point in time seemed impossible. That is the story of Xenoblade 2. And Xenoblade 1 and 2 work in tandem to tell parallel stories to one another, while breaking down the human condition, but covering different aspects of that condition, and what it means to be alive, and what it means to be dead. Both games deal with them, and how loss in one way affects people, forces them to change, to come across to come up against a fork in the road and pick a path. Xenoblade 1 and 2, like I said at the top of this video, can be viewed as insular entities. They can be viewed as stories all of themselves, and be enjoyed wholly as that. But when taken together, they tell a more complex and endearing story. And in my opinion, you can walk away feeling more hopeful about the human condition than you did going into it. Does all of this sound complicated? Does it sound complex? It kind of is. And that is what I'm going to try and address with this series, the Saga of Xenoblade. To break down these complexities to their basic form, to put them all out into the stage, to drag them into the sunlight. Because Xenoblade is a series whose storytelling works 
on a surface level. You have great characters, great development, amazing scenes, beautiful presentation, and you can play the game and enjoy it just because of that. But if you break it down and you peer beneath the surface and you peel it back layer by layer, then do you only start to unravel all the little mechanisms and doodads that went into creating and crafting these stories and why these scenes work so well. That is where the true genius in Xenoblade lies for me. Xenoblade 2 is a colorful, grandiose world filled with myriad of monsters and color palettes and grand vistas that just suck you in and refuse to let you go from its gentle embrace. It's captivating and the perfect set piece for the story to unfold and acts as the perfect, grandiose, fantastical contrast to the extremely human, down-to-earth narrative that shall unfold. Whereas Xenoblade 1 is set on the back of two titans, representing two different sides in the war effort, and the us versus them mentality that we covered last time, Xenoblade 2 is meant to represent more of an entire world, so it's populated by a bunch of different titans, inherently different to one another, with their own cultures, values, and militaries, and hierarchies. This fallen civilizations, remnants of others, it has history to it, culture, and having each Titan be one civilization allows them to stand out aesthetically and to feel completely separated from one another by the Sea of Clouds. And eventually, we will have to bring them all together. Unlike in Xenoblade 1, where everything's connected, where the two Titans are technically connected by the Sword of the Mechonis. In Xenoblade 2, all of these Titans are disconnected from one another. There's no seamless world, there's no boundary to the zone you can just walk into the next two. No, au contraire, mon ami. Get a boat. Because until the end of the game, you will never see another Titan on the horizon outside of the world tree. And that's not a Titan, that's the world freaking tree. You feel isolated and alone, and that is the feeling Xenoblade 2's world is trying to evoke. That feeling of isolation. That all these countries, all these peoples are separated from one another, unlike in Xenoblade 1. Now, there is another element of Xenoblade 2 I really need to address, and that is the use of anime tropes. See, these have a purpose, and going from Xenoblade 1 or 3 to this can be jarring. 2 relies way more on traditional, generic anime human camera shots, or extremely animated, and at times, cartoony facial expressions. But they serve a function. Where Xenoblade 1 plays with the player's expectations to undercut them early and often to keep you on your toes, Xenoblade 2 goes for the haymaker. They keep up the tropes and almost episodic nature of Xenoblade 2's storytelling, until about Chapter 5, where they hit you with a right punch from downtown and pull the rug out from under you in one fell swoop and the story becomes way more emotionally packed and serious while feeling more and more mature and less cartoony than it had just been. So stuff like that, like the introduction of Torna with the slow-mo and the sound effects for when Malos, Jin, and Nia are introduced to Nia reacting to a wanted poster in Gormont, those scenes serve a purpose, and that is to make you believe the game is going to go one way, so that when it goes the other, it hits all the harder, and that sucker punch connects cleaner. Heck, think of one of the biggest tropes that 2 utilizes, Boy Meets Girl. It's literally the name of the final chapter because it comes full circle. It starts off with Rex happening to find a scantily clad Pyra who asks Rex to touch her chest for him to be saved, so they can share a life. That scene got memed on to no end back in the day if you were there. And yeah, it definitely feels like fan surface. And funnily enough, lore-wise, this stuff gets recontextualized. And I do love the scene, but they carefully utilize scenes like this to set up the plot later, while lulling you into a false sense of security with these tropes and character designs. That is one of the points of Xenoblade 2's narrative in terms of how it's trying to get you to feel and manipulate your emotions and expectations. And when we get to the end of the game, we will definitely be revisiting this scene in particular. For me, what may be slow pacing for others is brilliant foundation laying and story writing. It's foreshadowing done right, not as a substitute for character development, but as an enzyme to bolster it and speed its production. And then we get the high adrenaline fight scene with Pyra and Rex taking on Jin and Malos as Rex uses Pyra's sword, and we get a bunch of cool fights as Nia turns traitor and comes over to our side after realizing that maybe Malos is a bad guy for threatening to kill a bunch of innocent people. Just maybe. Maybe that isn't what normal people do on a Tuesday afternoon. There's also a funny little piece of detail here if you pay attention. And I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, but uh, yeah, Rex is kind of a freaking prodigy with the sword, ain't he? Man held his own against Malthus with just his sword skills. 
for most of both encounters. One back in Argentum and the other in Mor on the Morosaros. And he will hold it again in Chapter 2 against Morag. And funnily enough, the actual plot events of what happens in Chapter 1 are relatively straightforward. Rex lives on the back of Gramps and Pyra shares half her life with Rex after he gets run through by Jin. But hey, Rex getting Pyra's core crystal and the beginning of the game is on the back of Gramps. Hmm. Remember that for when we get to the end of Xenoblade 2 as the game comes full circle in that regard. Like I said, we will be revisiting this introduction at the end of Xenoblade 2. Rex wakes up, the fight with Torna ensues, Nia joins up with Rex, and Gramps comes in like a Call of Duty chopper gunner to rescue them, and whisks them away to Gormot for Chapter 2. Rex is just a humble little salvager, desperately trying to uncover secrets to reach Elysium while building enough money to support his home, Fonset Village, but he is thrust upon the world stage here. Now sharing half his life with Pyra, he has become the driver of the Aegis. One of the most important people in all of Ulrest, essentially over the course of five minutes. He is thrust into this new world, this world of responsibility. Whereas in Xenoblade 1, Shulk is walking his path of vengeance after the Mechon invaded Colony 9, and Fiora is seemingly killed before his very eyes. Two completely different introductions for two different stories woven together by one unifying character, Klaus. And that will do us for this week's episode of the Saga of Xenoblade. Next week, we'll probably do another episode for Xenoblade 2, and then afterwards, probably alternated week from week between 1 and 2. So I'm going to call the stream there for the day. Thank you all for tuning in. My pleasure for making the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out and helps support future content, and I greatly appreciate it. Stay safe. Have a great day. Go play some video games if you can. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Hit the bell icon to be notified when I upload and stream in the future. Stay safe, a great day. Go play some video games if you can. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Until we meet again.